legitimate way. And um, Mary and I do just a lot of this kind of performance because we've got to believe that's one way to go. Now, there's one other thing I'll say about it. There's a lot more to say about it. One thing that's important. One of the things that we really like about performance is it undermines its own validity in a certain sense. Because if you know it's performance, it now already, even sort of cultural binary, isn't ultimately serious. It's like not a, not a scientific truth. It is a, it's a play. After all, only a play. After all, only a poem. No data. Not the real serious stuff. So you've already said, look, take this on. Try it out. This is the one way of doing it. It's not the ultimate truth. And if you don't master this, you haven't got it. It's a trap. And uh, I would really like that kind of a kind of a Derridian mm -hmm. writing through with a slash mark on what you're trying to say. So it's, it's another, it creates possibilities. It goes back to this idea of, yeah. of creating possibilities. Yeah. Uh, Normally, you said something very interesting before about giving voice to the art. And I, I would be curious to know your position on this, because the idea of giving voice to anything or anybody puts in a strong position of power. And let's know what, what your take is on this. And yeah, how like do we counter that? And, uh, uh, I mean, it's not a good phrase giving voice to. I think what I'm, I mean, I agree. It's very problematic. Because uh, we're appropriating space and having people, I'm mean, writing narrative and script and text and having it spoken and so forth. So uh, it's very troubling. I think you have to be very careful. What does it mean to be careful? What, what should, how can people, can researchers be careful? We haven't talked about intentionality, uh, um, which is another word that has a line drawn through it, uh, yeah, to read it or erasure, because we don't really talk about intentionality. Uh, and, I mean, once we've gone through this space, the uh, intentionality, meaning what the person's intending, the, the sense of agency, uh, agency having intention, that's all up in the air. It's all very con confusing. So how are you going to write, how are you, how are you going to construct agents who have reflexive capability, as they can talk, they can engage in conversation, think each other's point of view and just talk back, without giving them some sense of intentionality regarding ideology and meaning and purpose. And I think you, know, you can't not do that. So, but you cannot do it seriously. Right, yeah, right, right. Uh, so how will you construct that around what parameters, around what poles, uh, with what intentions? That's. I think a dilemma and a challenge for the whole project. But I go back, I don't, I don't think Ken will agree with this line, but I've used it quite a lot. Um, I give it to students that have no idea what I mean because they don't know who Harold Garfinkel is or was. Who knows who Harold Garfinkel is or was? All right, okay. Okay. Ooh! <laughs> See why you don't use it very often. <laughs> Harold Garfinkel. <laughs> He, is, he founded a field called ethnomethodology. He was a sociologist. He was a kind of a phenomenologist. He was a radical student of everyday life. Uh, and his word ethnomethodology was, what are the, what's the methodology people use to make everyday life visible? So they can act on it and act in it. And so Garfinkel, quote, late Garfinkel, not early Garfinkel. <laughs> he said, there's nothing of interest under the skull. What would he mean by that? Well, I think he meant, <laughs> I have no interest in intentionality or subjective meaning. I have no interest in that. That's not my project. That is not my project. My project is to write about and study how people make the real visible. And then to critique the structures that make that visibility visible. But he didn't go that far. That's my, my, my move is then to critique the structures that allow the visible to become visible. 
but I am not going to get hung up on intentionality and meaning and subjectivity. That's not my project. That's not my project. Now I know you're a psychologist, and you know, and, and, and Ken has already troubled what psychologists can do with process and meaning and subjectivity. That was your opening. That was your opening statement. It's all up for grabs. It's, it's moving. It's a moving target. It's not stable. We don't know how to talk about it, but you still do. It's your bread and butter. Garfinkel takes that away from you. So if he takes that away from me, what does he give me in return? He, he, he sets a challenge for me to create a text that can function as a critique of the apparatuses of the real that produce structures of oppression without getting deep into some kind of narrative of meaning and subjectivity and latent understandings and unconscious and conscious and identity and so forth. That is another chapter. That's an old chapter. That book is dead. We don't read that book anymore. We don't go there. That's another country. We are in this country of performativity, of language and discourse in play in a concrete situation, producing a representation of the real. Period. And those narratives that I write don't include references to what people mean, or what they feel, or what they think. That's not easy, and I can't do it very well, but I'm sure doing a lot of it, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to get better. <laughs> Except what I don't want to do, I mean, I'm on the project in a sense. Yeah. I think the whole relational process thing is to develop another, another form of language, another way of yeah. talking, which leads us into another direction. Yeah. But, all right, I've got psychoanalytic friends, I've got humanists, I've got spiritualists, and so on. I don't want to eliminate those languages because every language allows you to do something, allows you to be in some kind of tradition. If you eliminate all the traditions outside of what we're doing, we're really dead. I mean, most of what we value in our everyday life would be lost, mm -hmm. because we do talk, as you say, in that way. Mm -hmm. What I didn't mean to. I really I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. Yeah, yeah, no. you know, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. Yeah, exactly. We use all the language. We want to get rid of that to try to see how it's being used and, mm -hmm. and and appreciate that, mm -hmm. at the same time seeing its limits and how it's mm -hmm. being misused. Yeah. So it's, again, this balance of trying to work with the multiple yeah. traditions, which to me is it's kind of a constructionist project, and you would look at it as a postmodern or post-structuralist project. Yeah. It seems like, for both of you, I see a lot of Foucault here. I mean, the question more from yeah. what is a particular experience, say, depression, trauma, to how does an experience become visible to society, to the person, become, to how does a particular truth emerge? What, what do you see as, I mean, we still have a, an experience though, or a person before us who is suffering, who is uh, talking about psychology here. Mm -hmm. right? How can this particular per reflection on the social construction of the discursive dimension of the experience, it had the person before. Well, you can't use the word experience anymore. You realize that. <laughs> That's gone. Okay. Right. The line drawn through that word. And we know that now. The post structure critique of the word experience is it's a social construction based out of an articulation of a belief about actors with agency, with who are themselves social constructions within language, and if language is inherently unstable, then the very agent who's constructing the meaning of the experience is itself unstable. So that word is a construction. It's a political category. All right. Okay, so now what do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> this particular awareness that this word is a construction. Okay. How is it useful to the person who is before me, okay, to see me as a psychologist, and now, and he's apparently constructing his or her sufferance in a particular way. That's the person is still suffering. He's doing something. Or doing something, well, yes. <laughs> so we would articulate how he's doing that something, mm -hmm. and what are the things that are in that suffer that, that thing that are allowing him produce those things that he's calling this. What's, what's he pointing to? What are those things that he's giving agency and meaning? That's what I would do. 
so going beyond, to an extent if I hear you correct, but beyond the, the autobiographical I. Ah, so yeah, so yeah. Yeah. The, the beginning are. here. Yeah. Yeah. So making it personal political. There's a story uh, by Raymond Carl, I'll try to make it, it's called Why Don't You Dance? And they made a movie out of it. And uh, so this uh, uh, the story is real, real short. A man has a yard sale. And he moves everything out of his house into his front yard, including the bedroom suite and the dresser and the nightstand. And plugs the TV in and puts the coffee maker on and he plays some music. And a couple of kids walk by, a couple of a couple of walk by. They're getting married and they're buying things for their new house, for their apartment. So the man walks down the street, comes in and, and says, why don't you kids come in? To, I want a drink. He offers them a drink. And he said, you want to dance? So he puts a, a record on. The, he's got the record player plugged in and he plugs in the record player, puts a record on. It's like a Frank Sinatra. The kids are dancing and the man's sitting there drinking and he's smoking a cigarette. And, and, the, and the woman says, well, let's buy this bed. We see if he'll sell us the record player the TV. And, so, and, and he does, and the kids dance, and, and several weeks later, this woman, she's talking to a friend, and uh, she said, he was this old man, he had this, all this crap in his yard, and he had this music playing, and, and I don't know what he was doing, and you know, we bought some stuff, and I didn't understand the music, and he was drinking, and we danced, and we bought some stuff, and she kept talking, now the narrator says, and she kept talking like this, and she kept talking, she kept trying to explain to her friend what this meant, and she kept talking, and finally she quit. Hmm. That's the end of the story. She could not discover the intentionality of the, the underlying, those actions of that man who set this suite up in his, in his front yard, drank whiskey, danced, and sold these kids. And Carver's point was, I don't have to understand what his meaning was. I don't have to understand his history. All I have to do is create the scene that he created and paint it for you, and you draw your conclusions. That's, my, that's one of my projects. And then to critique the apparatus, that's Carver's missing step. Critique the apparatus, the collapse of the middle class family, the rise of alcoholism in the family. What's behind that family falling apart and this man selling his life like that in the frame? That's where I want to go, but I don't care I'm not going to write about what happened in that marriage and what led that man that morning to get up, start drinking whiskey, and playing records in his front yard. That's not my project. There's a difference between the chunk. Okay. I want to add a piece. Yeah. And by, and by well, way, yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt? After Ken's yeah. uh, contribution, we're going to take questions from, from you. There's one thing that really um, fascinated me is the possibility, because we can we can demonstrate, we can liberate, and so on. But the question is, what then? Is it possible we could also open a space for co-creation of alternative languages, alternative ways? That is, what would be the collaborative process by which we could move from one state to another state? Here are the understandings. I understand the limits of this language. I understand the way in which suffering got to be this, what we call suffering, got to be this way. I can understand how psychopathology got to be called this sort of a thing. What else could we do? How else could we go on with it? That is that co-creation of the new voices, of the co-creation of the new realities, and how to, how to get that started, how to, how to work with people to make it happen. To me, it, it removes, it, it sort of shifts the whole balance of research from kind of a reflection on to, to a making with, to the creation of a new alternative. And that's, that's sort of where I really find most of my attention to other these days. Which is also in line with the Paul Freire and the critical pedagogy. No, it's not. No, it's okay. not that. Well, Freire doesn't go there. It's, it, it's critical. But the question of what's next. So code doesn't go that far. It goes all, all about resistance, but you don't know where the hell to go after that. You resist everything, what have you got? Nothing. It's all right, so we understand the problems of individualism. It's one of the ways. I understand that whole tradition is, is deeply problematic and we're all in some sense suffering from it. 
that way? What would be the alternative? What would a relational world look like? How could you articulate a language mm -hmm. where there aren't any individuals, there's only a relational process, out of which maybe an individual would be an artifact, but the relational process is the real. And what would make that make happen or bring about in, let's say, education and organizations um, and therapy and so on? Co-create the alternative language, co-create the alternative realities which are going to get you where you want to be. But thanks a lot. We have approximately 16 minutes, 20 minutes to uh, hear questions from the audience. So, anybody? We can go over time. It's a social construct. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I am working on a project that I think combines these two perspectives. And it's, it's a co constructing with another person uh, their life story of trauma and resistance. And frankly, I don't understand why everybody's not doing it this way. <laughs> uh, you know, to not work on them, but to work with them, and to not just uh, use a written text, but use a visual text, whatever text seems to be appropriate, and not just write, but to go with them wherever their lives lead you to go, uh, to then co-construct the life experience, and I am interested in experience and meaning and what this means to them and how they, how we can co-construct co the story together and how we can co-construct what the story means, because I am interested in meaning. I really like that, because I mean, even interviews of co-constructions, they're just subtle. The very form of the question is already part of the answer. But what you're doing is really making that transparent and joining in the dialogue. I mean, to me, that would be like inventing a new move within a different space of understanding of what you're doing. Um, Susan, yes. So, so I'm curious what's left of psychology. Whether psychology, whether there's anything left to do in psychology, or uh, because if it's if if, if we're not interested in the, the, the meanings and the, the, the quote experience. I mean, if it doesn't exist, is there anything left? What are we doing? Well, what could psychology be? What could psychology be? Uh, uh, in a way, I believe we through that. Is to say, look, it's a sort of an issue of what you might call a, a critical pragmatic. That is, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? What kind of world do you want to make? Given the sort of moral or ideological structure you want to work within. And then use every relic you have. I mean, that means interviewing about the essence of their spiritual life and what it means to them. That's going to lead you where you want to go. Make that real. There's nothing that's ruled out. In my, my construction of view, there's nothing ruled out. We don't have any legitimate grounds for eliminating anything. Ask yourself what around the world you want to create and is that going to get you there? So you don't do it because you really want to find out and make sure that's what people mean or think or experience or feel. You are creating the whole idea of meaning and feeling and spiritual and so on in the very doing of the project. And is that, what, is that going to contribute to the world that you sort of see? That, that would be worth doing for me. Because yeah. so you're writing a culture. Yeah, it goes back to the idea yeah. of culture making the process of life. My goodness. I want to ask if there are limits, if there's limits for the dialogue. That, you know, you talked a lot about the, of dialogue, dialogue, and you, you mentioned the idea of co-constructing. So I want to ask, how would it look if I would want, for example, to co-construct co not with the victim, but with the, you know, Nazi? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or with people that I, you know, completely disagree with their point of view, and right now I can think of... 
millions of them in my country. Think, in this think of all the people with whom you have some some disagreement. You want to invite to talk to. But so could you is that, is that, if we them? don't do dialogue, we don't have anything. You're going to be without anyone to talk to. Because we don't all agree on everything. That would only be you. And, and you don't disagree. And you disagree with yourself. You actually would push a little bit. I, I'm playing. But Look, that's really hard. I understand that. I mean, I have a brother who voted for Bush. I couldn't talk with him for about six months. <laughs> like, I just could, couldn't deal with him. He wants him. But if I don't learn to have that dialogue, then what kind of world are we headed into at this point globally? That is a hard move. If I have a high, righteous high ground, I'm probably in trouble. Well, the, you know, th this is a good place to uh, bring us back a little bit to Conquer Good's project, and you know, I still grieve for his loss. It's a fantastic loss, uh, not only as a fantastic uh, performance scholar, uh, but also as a human being um, who saw, who had a vision that uh, all of the humanities and sciences were about value and about the good. The good hasn't been talked about much today, interestingly enough. Um, um, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, Conquer Goods Project, um, and I, you know, I feel uh, wonderful to be able to say I had many conversations with him about it, um, was uh, to live uh, with the people that he was studying, um, to uh, grasp their ways of talking um, and in serving the mission of social justice um, to perform their lives as close to how they would themselves perform it but didn't have the privilege that we in the academy have uh, and to take those out to audiences who would reject them, okay, and to enter into dialogue with those audiences by performing those scenes, those lives, as close as he could get to them using their voices and their language, um, in order to put him in the place of uh, dissent. And um, that was you know, in my view, uh, what that what that project is about, and I was about, and I think it's a midpoint between somewhere between um, the two ideals here, and I think there's a lot of crossover here. But Norm's uh, obvious interest in social justice and the politics of qualitative inquiry. And Ken, your notion, at least as I understand it, that social construction, to me the most important thing about social construction is it gives us a language uh, and an approach to the social world that says maybe we can, maybe we among ourselves or in various communities can decide what is good and try to create it. Try to put it out there, create a language for it, create a community identifying with it, and make it happen, which is a very, very different project. I think it goes back to the 17th century and what I understand the original intent of social science to be, um, which is empirically oriented, but about what is possible, what good is possible in the world. Um, and how can we create it? And so I guess that's just a comment, but I see that as a midpoint between you because I think all research is is political, but we don't have to say you know we don't this language of hegemony. I hate the word hegemony because it 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 only means something to a very small number of people, um, and if we continue to just talk to ourselves. Um, and don't try to 
get in, that's what I loved about Conklin's work is we need to purposefully move into those, like the question I would ask Norm is, how do you know when you've been successful? You know, when you have produced a critique that makes a difference in that world, yeah. that the people you're so concerned with bringing social justice to are being perceived differently by the audiences that you want them to. I don't know. Yeah. That's just a reaction. Uh, and then the other point is, disciplines, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and one of the things I love about this Congress is, except for like a day in, where we define a day in psychology or social work, and I understand the necessity for doing that, we're trying to be together, even though we're educated in different worlds. One question I want to ask ourselves reflectively, I mean, I think regardless of where we are in all this, and a lot of what brings us together is most of the research we do we're pretty passionate about. Something we care about something. We want something to happen. Not just abstractly make getting it right. We're involved with something happening. Here's the question, are journals shooting us in the foot? If we want something to happen, is where it's going to happen in a journal? If we look at that as the end point, because that's going to get us special clues, people, everybody's going to read that, which they don't. <laughs> and then it just stays there. And I, 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 yeah, it does something, but if we really want to make something happen, is that where we ought to be placing our energies? It's like, what would be the next step? I really don't explore, explore that possibility. We, we have time for a last question. Yes. Can we go back to that previous question, please, because I think this is the, the um, important issue that there's sort of a, a divide even between the two of you. I see you as a moderating principle. You know, if we, if we have this idea about a critical pragmatism, the you know, kind of world that we want to make, and then that includes sometimes burying one history with another history, or it always um, will. Right. Or having in a classroom, you know, require use some other language other than academic language. Um, th those are violent things too, and they're oppressive. And I, I, I just want to hear take this critical pragmatism to its conclusion and, and say <coughs> we're also equally ethnocentric about what we're doing because the moral political stance is a result of the background that Professor Denison has, or like she's talking about people she disagrees with. You want to create a world that obviously, you know, uh, probably the majority of the people in the world come from disparate religious traditions and, you know, across Asia and Africa and so on, who think things about other people that they don't share the sort of progressive liberal values that I do. Right? But I mean, I want that world, not their world, isn't it? So as much egalitarian equity I, we, we want to fight for, we also want a world where they change, right? Where they're not thinking that way, where they see, you know, uh, marital relationships and different things differently than they do, right? And uh, so how do I impose on a student to say, use a language other than academic language? And if he can't, if she can't, then do they get to see now? So with the, there's a couched sort of, uh, once we've undermined, uh, once we take constructiveness and formativity seriously, then um, whatever position we're fighting for is itself as arbitrary as any other. Is it? And it becomes very dangerous. I mean, this is the road towards, you know, depending on how we, how it's done, um, it could easily go in different directions. It could be a Maoist, or it could be some other, you know, successful utopian. That's the danger. My sense is, you know, you, you have these visions of good and where we all go. But if you would do that collectively, if you would do it dialogically, count on the fact that it really is the dialogue, dialogue is working, you won't want to be in that same position when you finish that dialogue. That is, the whole vision would have changed. Start there, but that's not where you're going to end up.
And I guess there's a little bit of that in the way of what how you feel when you've got something done, or something you've been successful, it's never, it's never stops. You can always the next move under which that's going to change in terms of how you understand what that's a successful or not. But do we say like a Rorty, yes, these are my values, I grew up this way, and I think the world would be better if this is how it was, and I'm, I recognize I'm at the center for feeling that way. But, yeah, absolutely. Uh, to me, that's not a place to be. You want to be in connection. It's like freezing the conversation. I'm out of the conversation. I'm not relating, but this is my value. This is who I am. You're out of the process. Yes, but the pro valuing the process is a value. What? Valuing that process is itself a value. I mean, that's it's already a value. And you can say, well, I don't value the process. No, I, I can't. I can't admit you otherwise. All I can do is say, what well, I can't you like? <laughs> to do. Okay, well, thanks a lot. <laughs>